Hello ladies and welcome to our first parent panel with on Talk Time Tuesday with the whole parenting. I'm really excited to have all of you here today because every one of you in your own right is doing something in the community to move our community in diaspora forward. And I really appreciate you all being here. I feel very privileged and very lucky to have each of you on the panel today to discuss a very pertinent and very um, timely topic and on talking to children about race and racism. Now, I would like each of you to introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about you. Tell us about um, who you are so our audience knows a little bit more about each of you individually. Shall we start with Tiffany? Sure. <laughs> well, yeah. Hello everyone, my name is Tiffany Giles Queensborough. I reside in Toronto, Ontario in the beach and I am a mother and a wife, a mother of three children, ages nine, five and three. So the older two are girls, boy. And uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share in my experience with me today's society and a discussion. Thank you, Tiffany. Holly. Right, hello, everyone. So happy to be here on part of this awesome conversation. I am a mother of two little girls. Uh, their ages are uh, seven and nine. I'm also married and I am an educator um, for about 17 years I've been teaching and I'm just so excited again to be a part of this awesome discussion. Thank you for being with us, darling. Nita? Oh, hi, um, my name is Nita Lewis. I am a mother of two children. I have a nine-year-old son and a teenage daughter. Um, I'm married and I have uh, over 13 years in um, child um, education and also in um, working in child, um, children's centers. And I have a passion for parenting. So thank you so much, Lou, for this opportunity. Thank you, Nisa. Sheila. Hi, everyone. My name is Sheila Smiler. I'm a mom of one. He's going to be 10 soon. And I'm married as well. I. I'm the founder of an organization called African Mommy, and it's predominantly focused around empowering and supporting women of African origin or heritage. And I'm also a digital marketer by profession. Yeah. That's it. Thank you, Shalane. Simone? Hi, Lou. Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. I'm Simone James Henry. Uh, I am a mother to two little girls. Uh, I have a nine-year-old and I have a three-year-old. Um, I currently am based in Dallas, Texas. You can hear a UK accent from the UK originally. Mm -hmm. And had a few years uh, based in Canada, Toronto. So I'm uh, ha really happy to be a part of this uh, conversation. And uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing about all of your experiences. Thank you, Simone. And I'm Louise, and I'm a mom as well of two. I have a nine-year-old, and I also have a newborn baby. And I'm doing this today, and I am exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the work must go on. And yeah. I am also the founder of The Whole Parenting and organizing this parent panel. And this is the first of, I hope, many parent panels that we will have to discuss issues around um, raising, parenting children of black heritage, which is quite an important discussion to have. And I'm so happy that all of you all are here today. Now, we we are coming out of, or still in a pandemic, really. We've been in a cocoon mm -hmm. of a pandemic. And at the time that we were in the cocoon of a pandemic, we, ended up with the issue around the racial tensions coming off of the murder of George Floyd and everything else that happened after that. Mm -hmm. Now, in this happening, it 
Just this out of our pandemic cocoon, of out of our social isolation, reminding us of how family this is an issue. Reminding us of the fact that even our children go through um, racial prejudice and mm -hmm. they will face even harsher racial prejudice as they do. And so I felt that it was necessary to have the conversation mm -hmm. about race and ra racism and how we talk to our children about race and racism because in speaking to parents, I realized, and full disclosure, I myself found it difficult having the conversation with my son about George Floyd. And a lot of parents find it difficult having the, these very um, have these very deep conversations about race and racism. And not just that, but race and racism in general, not just coming out of things that have happened in the media. And so I know it's beneficial when considering um, best practice in parenting for us to remember how we were introduced or our situations when we found ourselves in a similar situation back when we were younger or the first time we had an experience, a similar experience. And so I want to ask a question. Because we are representative of countries from around the world, we have St. Lucia, we have Dominica, we have the UK, we have Nigeria, we have Canada and the US re represented here. I expect that we would each encounter racism in a very different way and maybe in a very different time. And I remember hearing um, Tina Amanda Adichie respond to a question on racism by saying, I became black in America and that really resonated with me as an immigrant because I'm from Dominica but I live in the UK. I migrated to the UK many years ago and I felt that I became black in the UK. Don't bear with me, don't get me, don't get me wrong. <laughs> Not because I was never aware that I was a black woman, not because I wasn't very in touch with my blackness and with my African heritage, not because that I hadn't embraced my African heritage, but because I, when I came to the UK, my blackness became shrouded in otherness. Mm. It was, it became a very different type of blackness. It wasn't the black that I was when I was in Dominica was a, a very different type of black. And so when when um when Chimamanda made the statement, I said, Oh, this is exactly how I've been feeling. And so I know that we all have different experiences. Now, Sheila, your hand is I think <laughs> on to answer the question. Do you remember when you became aware of racism? To be honest, I was just, yeah, I raised my hand because, as you just said, Shuma Manda is from my country. I'm from Nigeria. And I was the same way. You know, I, I moved here 20 years ago and I didn't even know I was black. Like, I know you said that. We don't call ourselves black people in Nigeria. We just call ourselves Nigerians. We, I'm yeah. from, I'm Yoruba. You say you're Yoruba, you're Igbo, or you're Awisa, but you don't say you're black. So when I go here, people started putting labels on me saying, I'm black. I said, I don't look black. I'm not, the color black is different. So for me, I was exactly like her. It was the same thing. And when you, when you talk about the question about when did you experience racism or, so I moved here over 20 years ago. I, I moved to Ireland, the Republic of Ireland. And Ireland is very different from the UK in terms of, you know, different people still coming there. So I think it was about 20 years ago that, maybe the, a lot of Africans started immigrating into or um, moving to Ireland. So again, it was quite different for me. For them, they were learning about me, which was very odd. So I'll, I'll give you an example. I was, I moved there to do, I, I was studying for my final year in secondary school. So I had, I, I was with a lot of young people. So obviously, you know, I, I was still young myself. Um, and in class, I would have children or kids asking me questions about where I live, 
in Africa? Do we live on trees? Um, do we do we not wear shoes? This was I know a lot of people have, have said the same thing, and I did have someone ask me that question. And even something as simple as when you're when you're speaking to someone and they're not patient enough to listen to your accent. Uh-huh. So it was a case where I had a thick accent. I, I was from Africa, you know, I have an African accent. English is not, I have my own native language. So English was my first language in terms of how we were taught in, in Nigeria. But again, it would be different from an Irish, Irish person speaking. So, you know, for them, it, a lot of children were impatient enough to even listen to me. So you can ask me a question as simple as, um, do you know where the class is? And I answer back, just describe, telling them where the class is. But it's like, what? Like, what are you, I can't understand it. And they just, you know, shrug you off. So for me, as a, as a teenager, it was quite difficult for me to say, like, can people even be patient? I even had teachers sending me to an English class, like an extra English class. Not because I didn't know how to write it, not because I wasn't good at it, I wasn't passing my exams. I don't know. It was just because we were foreign. So we had to have extra classes yeah. for English. And that, that had nothing to do with our grades, which was a bit odd. So if you call that racism or I don't know, it, it wasn't blatant, but things simple as that. It is microaggressions. Was quite, yes, microaggressions. So yeah. that was quite um, an eye opener for me. And yes. that was my first experience of that, I think. But yeah. So sorry, Interesting. people on Facebook Live, we had some technical difficulties. So we thought we were streaming and we were actually not streaming all along. So you must have missed a bit of what Chile was saying and and some of the introductions. And I'm really sorry um that you missed that. Somehow <laughs> we missed it. Um, we missed that we lost the feed on Facebook. So I hope it remains now. Um, now I have Tiffany's hand up. So we're answering the question of do you yeah. remember? It is my race and how we became yes. aware of race. Yes. Re- Tiffany. Yes. So interestingly enough, um, my first experience with racism actually was in my own family. So I am born and raised. Canadian. However, I have heritage from Guyana in South America and Trinidad in the islands. And, you know, I think when people think about racism, they think about everything outward, but we have a lot of microaggressions and racism within our own communities. And so when you come from a mixed race community, um, in my case, it's Indo-Caribbean, African Caribbean heritage, there is sometimes a culture clash and then there's also a race clash. So for me, I unfortunately, and, I, and, and the truth is, is that I don't think sometimes communities even realize it's happening because it's so ingrained in our heritage yeah. that when conversations are being sent about those people, so those black people, that's how they are. Or yeah. you know, I've heard terms like monkey. And so I'm in the room and questioning, are they talking about? Because last time I checked, I look like those people that you're talking about. <laughs> Uh, And so I think not realizing that it was racism because I felt like I am a representative of this combined community or I'm I'm, I'm representing a combined community, but not identifying because I am loved by the same people who are actually um, being racist or racist. And so that was my first encounter. And so to follow that up in elementary school, not actually seeing color and being in a community in the downtown Toronto um, core where in my time, everybody got along very well and it was an economics thing. So everybody was basically coming in as an immigrant into the country. And so your experience was shared. You just didn't have any money, right? So you played with each other and everything was fine. It was not until I actually came into the residential um, neighborhoods and that we're in elementary and started to see groups separating and people identifying you as black and not wanting to engage. So it's interesting how, you know, I'm going back to first encounters, but then how racism comes into your life from different people in different times. So yeah. that was experience. Yeah. Colleen, thank you, Tiffany. 
Yeah, so I too, uh, I was actually uh, born in Suriname, but um, lived in Guyana for a little for a little bit. I came to America at the age of seven. And so my first experience with racism would have to be students, um, my classmates making fun of the way I spoke, uh, the dialect that I, that I had. And that was, of course, challenging because I've been in a community or in a country where everyone talks like that. So all of a sudden, I'm being made fun of. Um, but a little bit later on, I remember my little brother was on his bike um, riding in our community and he was stopped by a police officer and the police officers um, essentially kind of harassed him. Like he's just a kid <laughs> riding his bike like any normal kid would be doing and they just harassed him. And I think they gave him a ticket um, or, or something like that for riding his bike on the sidewalk and he had no clue. And, and so my mother was so upset so I remember her gathering us in a room and kind of having a conversation about um, police and policing and how as, as African American, how uh, we're viewed um, and how she kind of gave us that talk. That was like the first introduction to the talk, <laughs> mm -hmm. the talk of, well, this is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do, especially for my brother. Not so for me, it seems like it seemed as though for me, I didn't have to necessarily worry about the do's and don'ts. My brothers, it seemed, I had to worry about that more than I did. So those were my very first introduction to introductions to racism. Thank you, ladies. Um, in what? Yes, yeah, sorry, Simone. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll add my two cents into the conversation. Um, so. Um, as I said before, um, I'm from the UK, but currently residing in the US. Um, now my family's heritage is Jamaican. So very, very, very strong family structure um, was great to experience from birth, you know, right up to, to moving. And um, I think this conversation for me is slightly twofold. Yeah. So I was exposed. So we used to travel back and forth to Jamaica quite frequently. Um, to visit family and to, you know, have summer vacations. And um, I think it was when I was about 12 or 13, that trip, I saw or experienced classism, mm. right? So in the islands, racism, <laughs> maybe not there as much. Um, and the motto of Jamaica is out of many, one people. So you could be Chinese, Indian, black, whatever, white but you're, you'll identify as Jamaican. Um, however, you know, there is a classism or there was a classism issue back at that point that I was able to pick up on. Um, as a child? As a child, you know, I saw it. Um, and there were specific instances, I won't go into detail now, where I, you know, saw it happen to us. <laughs> mm. and, um, and then there's the other conversation of you know racism right which I was exposed to and it's really um interesting that there has been a there was a Georgetown study that's recently been released which speaks about um you know young black girls who when they express strong or contrary views yeah uh, they may be seen as you know challenging authority or fundamentally um, you know, just being kind of bad or disruptive, yeah, where, you know, that can be misinterpreted. So um, that was something that I had experienced um, at a young age. I, I don't know if I would have called it racism or just being misunderstood. But, um, it's, but it's I, I, microaggression I, in microaggression and multiplication. And that kind of led me to um, behave or answer in a predominantly, you know, uh, Caucasian environment differently mm. or try to um, shift myself so I wouldn't be seen, you know, in a, in a non-bad way, in, in a bad way. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, 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 I saw, I did see racism pertaining to others. Um, I wasn't necessarily called the N-word myself. Yeah. Um, but like you said, the microaggressions or the, 
you know, the kind of finger pointing where I didn't feel that was necessary is something I've absolutely experienced. So I just wanted to just bring that to light that, you yeah. know, classism is one area and then racism was something else that I saw. And this is something that we would like to discuss um, further. We won't have the time to discuss it today, but we would like mm -hmm. to discuss further the adultification of young black girls and things that our children will face in school and in society, like tone policing, exactly what you experienced, where you felt that you had to, um, to change who you were and make yourself seem more Caucasian so that you could be accepted and we can't go into this conversation because that's quite a heavy conversation to have but it is something that we as mothers parents in general need to have we need to have those conversations so that we can move forward because our children are facing these things whether we like it or not the research the science says our children are facing these things every day. They don't have a word for it. Some of them are too young to label it, but they are facing it. And when sometimes we need to figure out, okay, I'm going into a whole other conversation. Let Nita. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add just, just one thing. Um, I think I've had so many experiences that I can't even pin down one experience that would kind of... Um, you know, I, I could go back to, but one thing I, I experienced, and I didn't know what it was, is yeah. colorism. Um, yeah. So it, it, it happened in families, it happened in schools, and it was something that you, you there was there was some favoritism towards people who have a lighter skin tone. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I was trying to understand, is it just within our own kind of Indo-Caribbean race, um, our kind of Indo-Chinese um, Caribbean race? And then I realized, this colorism is actually a global colorism mm. where people see you, the first they see of you, it's a color of their skin, and then the implicit biases come in, and then they start to judge you and start to have their own inferences against you and start to kind of put you in the box. Um, and for me, that's, that's what kind of underpins those racist, racist um, experiences I've had. It all starts from people seeing me on my color as yeah. opposed to you know who I am as a person yeah yeah thank you ladies so we'll we'll go straight on to the next question and now we are aware of the research on racism and, and black children in in as it refers to black children in particular so we know that babies notice skin color from the time they are six months old children notice skin color my son used to say it call white people peach people he noticed it i hadn't had any conversation with him about race but they were peach and we we also know about adult of black girls we know about tone policing of, of, of children and of our adults, black adults we know that the research talks about our boys that our boys as young as 10 years old are being judged as adult men now that's 10 years old and that frightens me my son is nine i feel like there's a clock like we have this sun that timer and we're chasing the sun timer basically or trying to to run in front of it um children we know that children who encounter racism whether microaggression or whether it's overt or covert racism children who um receive those treatments they have ill effects there are ill effects on their their well-being there are ill effects on their development and it's long-term ill effects we know that we also know that children um who are not spoken to about race and racism those who are not encouraged to feel positive racial identity they later on have less self-confidence and less Re resilience in the face of racism so that's all from the science all from the um the reports that we're getting um and if anyone wants the reports later on and you're on facebook you can you can ask for um the the links or whatever and i can send it to you directly now we know that by the age of 12 many children become set in their beliefs about themselves about what they uh, are hearing and picking up from them the environment now it means that we have a short amount of time 
to do the work that we need to do for our children in preparation for what's going to happen to them inevitably. And I'm not just being negative here. I'm following on from what the research says. This is what happens. And unless something changes drastically very soon, our children will face these outcomes. That's, that's just what, it, it's just the way it is. Now, based on your experience, so there's no one size fits all. The science is there. The earlier you have the conversations with your children, the better able your children are to respond in the face of racism, the more resilient they are. Now, so I know that many parents have different ideas on when they should speak to their children about racism. Some don't want to approach the subject at all. Now, based on your experience as someone who has lived this life, we all have experienced racism at some point in time um, and based on your experience as mothers and your experience in work and in the work that you do in the community what do you think or when do you believe is the best time to introduce the concept of race and racism one so this is a twofold question and what should your approach to the discussion on racism with our, with our children be what should our approach be when it comes to the discussion on racism with our children. And I'm talking about in terms of an age-appropriate age ways as well and developmentally appropriate. Carlene, your hand is up. Um, so for us in our family, it started from as soon as they were able to identify color. Um, in the literature that they were reading, the children's books, even the children's Bibles, what we exposed them to early on in terms of like the TV shows or um, all things, anything that they were exposed to, we wanted to have a firsthand um, input in what it was that they were exposed to. Yeah. So not that we were limiting um, uh, other cultures, right? Or saying, okay, we can only watch black shows with black people or brown people that look like you but we were very intentional about that yeah so um from the shows that they watch and this from the books that they read uh they would start to ask questions like why do we um if they did see a show where they were not represented their skin color wasn't represented we would say they would ask so mommy daddy why is it that we don't see our, our ourselves in this show? And so that's when the, uh, the conversation about racism or just race and color and having them appreciate their color and love their co uh, the color that God created them with. I think that was like, that's like the very first introduction for them. And so it's on, an ongoing conversation. Yeah. So even in light of all that is happening in our, in our country, in our world, as it relates to racism, mm -hmm. this is not a conversation that's just sprung on them yeah. just like that. Like this is something that's ongoing that we continue to, as you said, age appropriately, yeah. be able to express what it is that we're seeing, but more so what they're seeing and have them have the opportunity to kind of talk it through and let them be the guide um, opposed to us guiding the conversation. Yeah. Um, the other thing that you asked, what was the other thing that you asked? Um, the latter part of your question. So it's what should our approach to the discussion on racism for our children include? I think you kind of touched on it a bit. So the age and the approach, how do you approach it? What do you include in that conversation? And I think you touched on it a bit, but you could expand on it if you... Sure. So I think it's very important. <laughs> I think it's very important for children to know the language. I think that's important. Know yeah. the language of what is a rate, what is racism? What is microaggressions? What is um, implicit biases? What is, what does all of that? So we start from there, just educating them in terms of the language so that when they are able to express themselves, they're able to express it in a very specific way. Yeah. as well as when they see it being done either to someone else or even to themselves which has happened in the past they now have the language to speak to it specifically and not kind of say well i think i kind of feel that this person no this person said this to me and this is exactly what i felt yeah. and so also other than the language building the language for them the vocabulary i think also having them 
what was I going to say? The thought just <laughs> slipped my brain. Having them, um, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. <laughs> oh, affirming them, right? After yeah. you have the language, but also affirming them with regards to um, who they are as, as brown people, as black people. Yeah. And so that they don't ever feel like they are lacking because the world may make it feel as though they're lacking, but they are not lacking anything. Yeah. And so yeah. those are like one of the first steps in taking to helping your child better understand racism. Yeah. In that conversation. And I like the, the bit about affirming your children. Thank you, Carleen. Tiffany. Uh, I sign off on many things that Carlene said. <laughs> uh, so I would say absolutely. So making that distinction between race and racism is so critical for, for our home. So mm -hmm. the initial component is race and actually uh, respecting and celebrating uh, that everyone is different. So as early on as preschool, which I find is that's when these things start to creep up where you're seeing children playing only with people who, that lo who look like them and reflect what they look like and how they behave. So letting my three-year-old, five-year-old at those different key times, let them know that, you know, you are brown. And so I've had one child who aspired to be uh, white and, you know, we can aspire to be anything, but that is not something that's going to happen. So <laughs> let's celebrate who we are because everybody is special in their own way. Yeah. Celebrate um, Similarly to Carlene, uh, all media, books, television, any form of gaming, anything of that must reflect you um, as much as possible. And I'm sure like many of you in the group are very intentional about this, not to exclude anybody else. And I do incorporate whether it's toys and dolls in their, um, in their model of yeah. engaging. But from the race perspective, it has always been a very intentional, affirmative that this is who you look like. And so it took about, I would say two years before my middle daughter started really accepting her color, her hair. Um, and that was work, that's mm -hmm. active work. Now it's actually um, come around where it's like, mom, look at this brown girl on TV. I want to be just like her. But that took active work, especially when you grow up in environments where you're predominantly uh, white. Yeah component to the racism piece is that so that's where I choose to do um, slight proactive work and then reactive work so we've had incidents unfortunately where uh, I can give a story where my eldest daughter they were playing a game with her classmates um, mm -hmm. and so there was a line that was drawn on the on the sidewalk and the the person that was coordinating the game said anybody that comes uh, anyone that's playing this game that has a red t-shirt come over on this line Anyone that has um, black hair come over this line. Anyone who's white come over this line, which left an Asian child, a black child, and an Indian child. So, or, or South Asian, I should say, respectively. So, you know, those are the things that come up. And then I say to say, so what does that mean? Or that's the same thing. What I say to her, what does that mean? How does that make you feel? And have to reinforce the conversation of how awesome you are, how beautiful are, you are, how important you are, but they actually recognize, children recognize the distinctions not only uh, as for moments only in classes, but in race and the opportunities that come with that. So we have to have a conversation about, you know, what's happening in the world. Yeah. How, how are you going to react in these scenarios? Um, and making sure that not only are her parents and her family reinforcing these principles, but your teacher is aware. And what does that mean in terms of engaging the classmates and having them understand how that makes people feel? And further to that, the principal. So when we talk about community involvement, so to add on to what Carlene was saying earlier, community is so critical in terms of making sure that your children understand how valuable they are in this time. Um, because on top of all of the resources, if we don't have reinforcement from our allies and our internal community, your children will naturally feel as if they're inadequate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Tiffany. Now, Shelley. Yeah. So, um, I completely agree with what Tiffany just said, and I was just going to quickly talk about an experiment that was done, I think, in 1940 mm. by a psychologist called Kenneth. I think okay. it was called Dr. Kenneth and Mary Clark. Okay. So this was a doll experiment where mm -hmm. they, the, you know, the experiment was done on both different colors of children 
and they asked them to pick a doll between, you know, from different shades of color. Yeah. So most of the children picked the lightest version, meaning a white child. Yeah. And they also attributed um, the best behaviors towards that child. So the reason why I'm bringing that up is for me, I think in terms of having to educate my people, my child, and also other people. Yeah. This was, that experiment was done based on the fact that they wanted to see how it affects children's self-esteem in terms of what they look like. If someone that looks like you and you're attributing, you know, bad behavior towards that person. So I have taken it upon myself not just to educate my child, also to educate my community and also the allies, as Stephen mentioned. You know, most of the information that we're getting are information based on someone writing it, not, you know, in favor of us and how we see ourselves is also, you know, how they want the history or how people, how they want people to learn in future. So if I have to educate anyone, I have to also look for information outside of where I would generally find it and ensure that I keep pushing that agenda, not just the agenda that someone else wants me to, you know, to push. So saying that, um, doing the George Floyd information or um, George Floyd um, issue that we had with George Floyd, his death and, and everything. So we took it upon ourselves to also speak to the, to the school, mm -hmm. to also educate the children, you know, people that don't look like me, to make sure that that conversation was had. Yeah. So I can't continue to keep educating my child without, you know, the, why the community or where is going yeah. to be going to school or um, the people is going to be speaking, we don't also understand the situation that is going on. So we make sure that that conversation is being had in school. And also I continuously speak to him, not just speak to him on, you know, when I'm angry or as he, as he said, not, not speak to him the way we feel at the moment, but speak to him and consistently tell him about his roots, where we are from, yeah. you know, and also just visit the place as well on a regular basis. So yeah it's very easy for him to then educate people on the playground. So if someone calls him and says, oh, you're African, you're this. No, I'm not. I know exactly where I'm from. I know, you know, who I am. And I, they can also keep educating children as well. So I can leave him with that knowledge without me having to worry that someone else is going to be teaching him something that isn't necessarily um, the agenda I want or the real facts, so yeah. to say. So I think that's important for us all not just look inwards, also outwards to continuously, you know, push that agenda and making sure, you know, we, you know, we keep teaching people what, what we should know and also what's missing. So yeah. my community does that very, very well as well. Just pushing the positive agenda of African people, black people. And yeah. Continuously and Shule, Shule, you have a boy and, and yes. also you have a boy as well. Tiffany, I think you, you have a boy also. Yeah. That's what I'm um, we we see in the media and we're still on the con conversation I'm, I'm just expanding this question so when you have the conversation with your children is it necessary and at what point do you start talking about self-preservation and safety protocol so we we're mostly here canada the uk america we're living we all here live in predominantly white society we come from across the globe in diaspora, yeah. but we live in predominantly white societies. Now, um, we know the issue in America, and that's very well publicized. What is not well publicized is the issue in the UK. Now, up to this morning, I saw a video of police arresting a black man, dragging him from his car, and this is in the UK, dragging him from his car, with his three months old baby in the back and take drag him he, he and his partner out of the car to arrest him. Mind you, they were wrongly arrested. Is <laughs> it was, the partner of the Olympian? They, they, it wasn't the right person. But this is what happened in the UK, dragging them out with batons in their hand. This happens in the UK. So we 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 don't want to forget that. Mm. Maybe it's not as bad as America, but it does happen in the UK. Now, mm. how do we prepare our boys when we're having this conversation? How do we prepare our boys? And I'm, 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 I'm just saying this so those who have boys when you answer any answer as well. Do we include that safety protocol and self-preservation 
it's not just even the boys, it's the girls as well, because they're dragging women out. Mm. I mean, yeah. I know more men are dying, but they're dragging women out as well, and they're shooting women. Mm. So how do we include this in the conversation? Do we include this in the conversation? How do we start it? Having a conversation about police brutality is a, a harder conversation to have than having a conversation about just about racism in general, because the people who are supposed to protect you, you are fearful of them. Mm. How do we still uh, speak to the children about this without them feeling afraid? Mm. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anybody? It, it, Nita? Yeah, it, it, it's a really, really difficult one yeah. because so the, the, the kind of like the behavior or, or the approach from the police towards black men. Again, it, and it, it stems from, from the, those implicit biases. And fear, yeah. And, and, and well, they would say they, they, they fear black men, but um, I think it's all those biases of how they perceive black people being, being yeah. more aggressive, you know, um, always having weapons or linking with drugs and gangs. So their perception already kind of uh, wiles them up to be more aggressive Mm -hmm. approaching them and again most of those, those young men you know there, there's nothing that they've actually done a lot a large percentage of them they have been mistaken there's been mistaken identity and they have been treated harshly you know with, without any evidence without any um any um um it's they've not been court. before the court or anything of, but, but before they're almost given the, like the judge and the jury before they actually um have any facts about what what the issues are so it is a difficult con conversation to start with with you know my son to try to explain to him that you know if a police approaches him say when he becomes a, a teenager or young man and he's driving to leave his hands at 10 to 2 to just you know try to be very calm to not be emotional and this and, and try to answer the questions as they, they ask um but we've seen that happen we've seen people as calm as ever and 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 the result you know is death for some of them so having the conversation is just really really difficult so it doesn't matter what approach you use for your child um the decision or or, or the attitude of the the police and and it, their approach you cannot control it mm -hmm. So it's, it's almost like you, you know, you're having those conversations over and over, preparing them, giving them the social tools, strategies, you know, having those learned behaviors, modeling things to them, and yet still they would go out there and um, and something tragic can happen. Yeah, I guess okay. it does feel like it's almost like a, you're pulling straws and who draws the short, shortest straw. But I no, guess absolutely. at the same time, there are things that we can teach our children um, about how to respond to keep themselves safe. And I hate that we have to have this discussion. I really hate that we have to have this discussion. But I guess it's a discussion, it's a discussion that we have to have to keep our children safe. Yeah. Susan, your hand, your hand isn't up anymore, Susan. Is your hand still up? <laughs> You're on mute. You're on mute. No, I, w I was just saying it. It's very difficult to have a discussion that seems to be about such an essential aspect of our lives yeah. in terms of one's identity, our purpose, our potential through someone else's narrative. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think this kind of leads to the earlier conversation. Um, in terms of the elements of preservation for me yeah. um, is around self-awareness, self-esteem, Mm -hmm. uh, around knowledge, yeah. around role models of leadership. Um, and so um, in thinking about the, um, the young people that I'm, whose lives I'm influencing, so that you have a knowledge of yourself and who you are and the strength and a knowledge of so you can detach slightly and say, this is not about me. Mm -hmm. Now, this is take, linking into all sorts of issues around also teaching our children how to express themselves, how mm. to express their feelings without feeling the need to be strong. <laughs> so that actually, if you are in a situation where you are being treated unfairly, um, if someone is some rogue 
police officer looking for uh, for police brutality, as Nita said, they will find it. Yeah. Um, so it's this thing of, well, how do I manage my emotions because I know who I am and therefore I can detach from the situation mm. and assess things reasonably. Now, um, I, I think it's that danger that we step into while trying to protect that we get to the situation that we get into these narratives of strengths, of working 10 times harder, being mm. overly protective. And because of that, we can find our, be positioning our children and ourselves in situations where, you know, the, the experience is compounded mm. by this knowledge that, oh, it's happening to me. Am I going to be a Sandra Bland? Am I going to be a George Floyd? So th there's a balance that can be made about preparing but not going so far as to that we rid we rid the individuals of their own responsibility yes. those people, mm. the perpetrators of their humanity that in that moment to do mm. what they should be doing because yes. we're so caught up in this being a systemic thing we kind of expect it so there's mm. a there's a there's a two there's two That's levels to that we have to yeah. be very cautious, cautious of I guess this is where what Shirley says come in because Shirley says that as much as we we educate ourselves and she, she talks to her son about stuff, she also speaks to the community. She speaks to the community that he belongs, not our community, just our community, but the community that your son has to live in, like the school that he has to go to, the 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 the, the mosque. Well, you you won't have the same if you at a mosque, but at a church that we have to go to, if we go to a multicultural church, if we go wherever we go, that's multicultural. You educate people wherever you go. You educate people in the community. You find a way to get to educate the police and i don't know how we do it how do you do it how do you educate so, the police and because this is years and years of entrenched it's like this universal con unconsciousness that mm -hmm. they have that that and um, they are steeped in this universal unconsciousness when they have this fear of black, this unnecessary unwarranted fear of black people and they feel that they need to act in this way and um so i think for me just to quickly add in mm -hmm. in terms of what you tell or what we tell our children or what i have to say to my son there are two main things and there are two very important things at least from 2020 yeah. going forward would be number one knowing your rights and what you need to do at that point yeah the reason why i say that is you know we've heard of people being told to just lie in their statement just based, based on the fact that they don't have any um, legal representation at that point. So they've had to switch their statement for anything, whatever happened. You know, knowing the fact that you don't have to say anything until you have some kind of legal representation, if that were to happen, you know, <laughs> then I, what that was going to happen. And also finding a way to, you know, show some kind of evidence, put on your phone, make sure that you charge your phone enough so when you have to film anything, so you can have proof yourself. Because without that, without those two things, I think you're in danger of you know, losing anything. Fair enough, you, know, you can still find police, the, the police, you, know, you can still find people that would still die in the process, but at least if you have those two things, that's very important. Because that yeah. would always, you, know, you always have that to take with you. So I think for me, that's, yeah, that's, is there, and Simone, uh, I'm going to come to you next, but is there, um, do we need to think about empowering our children and equipping our children, sorry, to manage anger and fear so that they channel it in a meaningful and effective way? Because if you encounter a situation in, I mean, you, you can encounter a situation in the playground. Little children, primary school children encounter microaggressions in the playground. Oh, yeah. They encounter microaggressions from their teachers. Let's be real about it. I'm on it. Mm -hmm. um, a child could get angry, not being able to place their finger on exactly what is, is upsetting. And this is where I think Carleen mentioned being able to name something, being able to call it a name. And knowing that this is what happened to me, mommy, this is what happened, and I can name it. But um, this could create, this could trigger anger in a child. 
we don't want our children responding in an angry way where it isn't productive. We want our children mm. to be productive in their response to whatever has happened. Because we know it's easy for people to say the angry black child, the angry black woman, the angry black man. Um, do we put that into the talk? You know, talking about how we manage our manage our anger and manage our emotions and is it even more important for black children to have um good emotional and social intelligence yeah wow lou that was that's heavy um so firstly i want to say um that with my now nine-year-old um we have created somewhat of a safe space at home mm -hmm. that if anything happens, whether it's with a friend at school, whether it's something that's happened in the house or like whatever, you have a safe space to come home and, and or speak to me or my husband Nigel about it. Um, my former CEO at American Express, a African-American man, Kenneth Chanel, one of his mantras is, you can only control what you can control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? So how can I, as a mother, you know, control this whole dialogue about race in the best way to get the best out of my nine-year-old. Yeah. So um, there are a few things that have to happen, I think, before the talk happens, right? So as a child, Carleen spoke about affirmation mm -hmm. from baby to whatever age. I think that's something that's necessary. Mm -hmm. um, I have moved now, this is my third country, so as a parent, it's my responsibility, first of all, to understand where I am in the world yeah. and what is happening in that country pertaining mm. to racism, right? So there is education that has to happen on the part of the parent to understand what is going on, where you are. You know, mm. this year you could be in the US, next year you could be in Australia, year after that you could be in Korea, wherever. Know the, the land of where you are, educate yeah. yourself, okay? Um, Carleen also spoke about, and, and Lou, you touched on, um, you know, books and TV and all of those things that can influence that, um, that you know, can influence the child. Um, as a mother, I have to know how best does my child receive information? How best does my child learn? Yeah. And I know that my nine-year-old loves books. She loves movies. So that's where I started. I started buying her. Yeah. self-affirming books and then we've moved on now to material and I've got a couple here that I can show you um mm -hmm. that talks about exceptional black women and black men you may oh my my son has that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> these are great um and here's another one that I'm getting my hands into uh which is the history of black people in Britain because okay. I want to speak about school okay um Again, as a parent, I recognize that it's not 100% the school's duty to teach my mm. child about where, what yeah. her heritage is and what her race is. We cannot mm. leave something so precious and so fragile in the hands of somebody else, okay? Mm -hmm. So I have taken um, a stance to share with my daughter um, you know, reading materials that we go through together throughout the year, not just Black History Month, which is great, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's the, it's a it's a it's a it's a weekly conversation that we have throughout the year. Yeah. Um, now, Louise, regarding the anger piece, now that is something. Um, again, you have to be the judge of that as the parent. Yeah. Okay, and you have to be able again to deliver. Um, information to the child in a way it might get them riled up okay they may feel well that's not fair why did that happen and that shouldn't have happened oh you know I I hate this and I hate that you know you have a duty as a parent to I think just you know calm calm that but turn it into something that can fuel them and energize them in whatever in, in whatever you know format you feel or that that child feels that they can move forward in right so um you know, I think that the, pa the, the parent has to have an education themselves, has to, um, you know, have that time with the child from birth, growing up, 
um, affirming them, giving them great material, okay? Now, one other thing I wanted to say, Lou, and I've been burning to say this, <laughs> probably not pertinent to your question, <laughs> but, um, you know, our history doesn't start with slavery. No. And that's often the narrative, I think, that children learn or hear about yeah. first. Yeah. There is a lot of history pertaining to blackness, Africa, uh, you know. I mean, first of all, there was no race, there was a human race, okay? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, races and terminology and labels came a lot later on, right? Mm -hmm. So now we're living in on this earth with labels and we will identify with being, you know, black, black British, black uh, Afro-Canadian, um, African-American, all of these different labels. Mm -hmm. But we have a rich history before slavery, and I think that's mm -hmm. very important to understand mm -hmm. that we did not start off as slaves. We yeah. were, you know, the, there were kings, there were queens, there were kingdoms, there was civilization, this and that. And slavery is a part mm -hmm. of the, the dialogue. It's not the beginning, and it definitely is not the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hope I've answered the question. <laughs> Yes, thank you. And, and I think it's about um, creating um, pride, in black pride, <laughs> without creating black superiority. So we are not superior, we are proud of who we are as a people. And we need to ensure that whatever we instill in our children, the environment that they are around is conducive for them developing that pride. Um, also, you said something else that I wanted to expand on, but I've lost my friend of course now. Um, okay. The, yeah, expanding on the positive sides of our, of our, um, of where we come from. Um, should we, in our conversation on race, talk to our children about white allies so we're talking to them somebody touched on diversity and appreciation of diversity and even your toys and you know you're, you're making sure your your child's toys are different colors and and the protagonist in one book is not just black but you have some white protagonists as well or, you know to make sure they are very well aware of, of diversity. But do we emphasize white allies and how do we do that without creating a sense of white saviorism? Yes, Tiffany. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I hit a chord with that one for me because <laughs> a lot of these terms these are political terms and so when i think about children i think about this is the world you're living in it's an international space yeah. we are designed well based on my beliefs to to be with one another yeah. um, depending on the space that you're in it may be more or less of you and so ultimately when i think about allyship i actually think that's for the adult realm yeah. i think that i think so too children, um, you know, bringing together everything that was said about, you know, reinforcement and, and, um, and, and um, uh, edifying our children mm -hmm. is to recognize that as a child, when you engage with anyone, regardless of color, that they are to respect you, to treat mm -hmm. you with fair, and it goes both ways, obviously, um, and to care for you and in, in their action and in their behavior towards you is what actually to me defines allyship okay. so to me i try not to use that term in particular with my children um so, other so i'm i'm not thinking of it in terms of using the terms because i think using the political terms is going over their heads but right. the concept so um because it's easy for our children to start thinking that if the white police who is supposed to protect me is hurting people like me then maybe all the other white people might not like any brown and black people so, so i think that conversation that 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 message could 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 children could get that message or the message could be misconstrued and yeah. so what, 
what I'm asking is, do we make sure that our children know or that our children don't see every other white person as being against us, but that we have some people who are fighting the fight with us, marching the march with us, and this has been happening from eons, you know, from day dot. So um, that's why we get to relationships, mm. because, and I think that happens in stages. So my son is three. Um, and so I say a lot of you are ahead of the game, but in my mind, I actually had a, a quick tip from a parent who has grown adult children now. I plan to introduce Emmanuel to the police department and let them know yeah. this is a gentleman that lives in your community. Yeah. He is a good, good person. We recognize the system that we're in. We are mm -hmm. here to make a partnership with you. We want to build relationships with you. That any encounter that you have with an individual is individual and not necessarily representative of the entire community mm -hmm. however not to take away from the fact that there are there is a large group of people who look this way that do believe that um yeah. you know that uh, that we are lesser than but um i constantly have to tell myself that you know when i deal with individuals that i cannot paint the picture globally because then it does create that aspect of they're going to save me and actually mm. save myself yeah. in a system that I know exists and it's not going away. So I don't know if that makes sense. Like in, I understand your question, but I feel like for me, um, the relationship is key with individuals yeah. and that determines how you perceive the allyship. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with, I agree with Tiffany completely. I think just to mention the whole notion of racism, as parents, I think we need to also be careful in terms of when we start educating our children about racism, mm -hmm. that feeling of, does that mean I'm, I'm less of a person than another person? The inferiority complex can always set in with the children when you start talking about, you know, why people think they're this or some people think they're that and they think they're better than you. So I think it's very important, as you said, when you're speaking to a child, you're talking about the relationship, how, you know, how they need to also educate someone else that thinks differently or even bring in their, their wider community within that. So that way, the child doesn't always feel like I'm the one in the spotlight for some reason or because I'm different or because I'm... So I, it can be uncomfortable because obviously it's a difficult conversation to have but always making sure that the children are aware that there's nothing wrong with you and, you know, the people that you have relationship with, not just people that look like you, but other people as well. You guys are equal. There's nothing wrong with that. But we shouldn't always have to beat on that conversation of, oh, some people think they are better than you. Because no matter, no matter how young you are or how old you are, you always feel that little bit of inferiority complex think, so why do they think that? And should I start behaving differently? I think, yeah, it can be quite uncomfortable. And I guess that's, uh, I'll just reiterate what Simone said, because Simone said, um, made a statement about doing the groundwork even before anything about racism. So you work with your children from the time they are babies. You, you think about bonding and attachment and how mm -hmm. important bonding and attachment is for um, being able to be resilient to, in the face of um, of any type of difficulty, whether it's, yeah. it's bullying from a black, um, you know, a black child, um, mm -hmm. but even, you know, racism itself. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Shilley. Colleen. Yeah, I agree with what Tiffany and Shilley um, uh, just said. I think it's so important to focus on your child's core right? The core of your child uh, so that that can be a plat. Once you've laid the foundation, right? Mm. In your child to, of course, love everyone, um, to, to know that God loves us all. And once you've laid that foundation, I think they then will be able to decipher, well, wait a minute, they're talking to me or they're saying this to me and I don't like it. Or mm. it's just, I think it's just important. Like we tell our kids in our home, that their voice is their superpower, their ability mm -hmm. to speak up and out, that is their superpower, their uniqueness, that's mm -hmm. their superpower. So I think once you have that foundation, once you've set that foundation within your, your child children, 
um, then they're able to point out what's right from what's wrong. And in terms of when you think, when they are able to see the injustices that happens in their classrooms, on the playground or wherever, they're able to call it out because they've been taught right and wrong. They've been taught what that looks like. They've been given the language as we talked about before. So at their core, they're able to decipher. They're able to know this don't look right. <laughs> so I'm yeah. not going, and I'm going to respond to that or I'm going to call on my parents um, who are my allies, who are mm. my, my fighters <laughs> to get in there and respond appropriately as well. Yes. Yeah. Lisa, okay. I think your hand is off. Yeah. Um, I, I, I really like what Simone said, agree totally no, 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 with what no. everyone has said so far. Mm -hmm. But I think if, um, just as you were saying, Lou, about when you're bonding with a baby, I think it's just as a parent when you're raising a child, you're trying to instill those positive um, characters in your child. You want them to learn about fairness, equality, diversity. You want them to see the world for what it is. I think once they have all those um, different traits instilled in them, they automatically grow and see race as something that's equal. Mm -hmm. So their mindset is already being formed uh, to, to see racism or to realize racism. So if they don't see fairness on the playground, they don't see quality in their schools, in their workplaces, in their environment, they start to recognize it. And then once they come back and they have those conversations with us as parents, it's up to us to strengthen them so they can build that emotional resilience yeah. towards what they see as not being fair or not being equal and um, seeing themselves as less of in a society. I think educating our children from a very young age, and I just think there's, because there's, all, there's this lack of um, information or books or you know, um, resources we can use as parents to educate our children, or it was mm -hmm. not what was forefront in, in schools when we were growing up, it's something we have to start to, to kind of like dig around for. But I, I think there's a plethora of information now that we can use. It's us using that resources and not using the traditional resources, probably not the traditional rhymes and all of that, but starting to build those things in our children from a young age and yeah. they will start to recognize who they are. They'll start to appreciate their history and not start to feel inferior as they start to grow in the community and not see a lot of people like them and thinking, yeah. oh, well, you know, white is right, so to speak. You know, mm -hmm. they'll start to appreciate other things around them, but really using and, and, and taking a lot from, from the way we were, we were raised, not parenting them the same way, that's different. But a lot of things we learned, you know, the, the, um, the folk tales and all of that, just making sure they understand it. Yeah. I mean, one thing we do is for my son, if we travel back or we have family or friends who travel back, we buy a lot of... Um, folk stories from St. Lucia for him. And these are his favorite things. These are the favorite books that he wants to read about. And he just teach, teaches him about a culture that he, mm -hmm. he didn't grow up with, but then that's his identity as well. He's not just a little um, black British boy, but he's also of a St. Lucian identity. So yeah. it's really important to kind of just get the groundwork setting, put those foundation and those principles in our kids as early as we can. And then we'll just see them kind of grow and have that emotional resilience in the face of all those social um, kind of ills that they will experience. Yeah. Now, to, to build on this question again, and, and you know, could all answer. Um, when when we have an issue in the in the media that's highlighted in the media, take for instance, like the George Floyd case. Um, I know there are parents, and I was one of those parents who was hesitant to talk about the George Floyd case with my son, because I saw the video and it floored me. I will not lie, it, it, I found it a traumatizing video. Um, and I just thought, if I find it so difficult to deal with this myself, how am I going to, how am I supposed to explain this to my child? And this is, um, my question now is people, do we, how do we approach issues in the media? Because as much as we think we're safeguarding our children and guarding them from seeing things in the media, maybe your child doesn't have their own devices and they don't get to watch TV without your supervision. So you know exactly what they're seeing and what they're not seeing. 
it is very likely that they overhear conversations. Oh, it's yeah. very likely what, and I know that for a fact, my son overheard the conversation, my, mine and my husband's conversation, and he started asking questions. It is also likely that children feel the, the stress in a secondary way. And young, very young children may not know exactly what is happening, but they will be feeling something coming off of mommy and daddy that mm -hmm. they don't quite understand. How do we approach those conversations when things of such things that are so heavy are happening? How do you approach the conversation with your children? Do you understand what I mean? Or am I yeah, just yeah. You understand, you understand. <laughs> I want to first say, well, if I can go first, I don't know. <laughs> sure, of course. Um, it's very interesting that you uh, asked that question. I think first, uh, the first time, I don't, I don't even think I, I looked at the entire thing. I think I just saw a snapshot. Yeah. Um, but definitely I did see a still picture of what transpired. Um, I just couldn't bring myself to just look at the video because of how traumatizing it is. You know, this is something that we've been seeing over and over and over and over again. And that's just some, I just didn't want to have to process through that trauma yeah. in that way. And so one of the things that we did was we had to process it within ourselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, my husband and I, we would have conversations and yes, there were some of the conversations that they did over here, but I think before approaching them, you have to first figure out how you're yeah. feeling about it mm. and trying and try your best to process through that how you feel uh what does that really mean and how do you give hope to your kids your little people that mm -hmm. have to live in this world right and so that's the first thing the second thing is um how we approached it was we just said to them have you guys heard about george floyd Ahmaud Arbery, Rihanna Taylor. Like, have you guys heard that those names? And honestly, they were like, uh-huh, we have. And so we asked them, tell us what it is that you've been hearing um, about those those uh, things. And so one uh, one of my uh, daughters said, uh, with regards to George Floyd, he was shot um, by a police officer. Um, and with regards to Ahmaud Arbery, Again, another, uh, they said he, she was shot, uh, he was shot. And then as it relates to Breonna Taylor, they're like, yep, she, and, and, I, and so they understand, right? Without us having to even talk about it, um, it with them, they understand or they know, they have some awareness in regards to what, what, what's happening. And so from that point, we then let them guide the conversation. So what are your thoughts? What, what, what do you think? you know, um, what do you think is that, do you think that's okay? And just kind of let them guide it and not push it too much. Uh, Cause I do believe that you don't want to bombard your children emotionally cause all that's going on with the pandemic and their home and exactly yeah. emotionally they are like over it as we mm -hmm. are, as much mm -hmm. as we are. So I think it's just super important for us to first acknowledge how we feel, secondly, listen to what it is that they have heard and maybe for the older kids what they've seen help mm -hmm. them to uh, let them guide the conversation and just correct and make the correct necessary corrections um, mm -hmm. as yeah um, I think that I, I agree I agree with um, what Karim said and just to give you an example of how I had I had the conversation with my son exactly what happened um, I told him and you know and it was funny that after we had a conversation, you know, he understood everything. So I spoke to the teacher to say, this conversation also needs to be had with the rest of the class. So at the moment, or while they were still in school, they, they have virtual learning where they speak to themselves together in class. And the teacher asked my son to just talk a bit about what they were feeling and what it thought happened. As much as I said to my son that, a man was killed by a police officer in knelt on his neck. I, I said exactly what happened to him because I, I don't miss the point. For my son felt that he didn't want to traumatize everyone else in class. So he said to his classmates, 
um, the policeman was being mean to the to George Floyd. Oh, I had to correct him. I went in to correct him. Like, he wasn't being mean. He was killed. So right. for him, he felt that he had to dumb down the, yeah. the situation so the other kids don't have to feel like, oh my God, he, was, he died. But the man died. So I, I just said to him after you know class that next time, if you feel like you're not comfortable, you can just say, you know what, you don't want to have the conversation. But don't try to you know change or, or dumb down the situation just because you feel that other people might feel uncomfortable. Yeah. And I thought that was quite interesting. Maybe I should not have said someone died. Me talking to myself saying, how else can I deal with that conversation next time? So maybe it doesn't feel uncomfortable about it. But, you know, I just, for me, I think just saying it the way it is and, you know, still having the conversation That's continually so he understands it. But that was my experience anyway. <laughs> Yeah, isn't it something that we as adults do as well, though? I think yeah. we, we, we protect other people. We, the, we are so careful with the language that we use. Like Simone was saying, you tone yourself down. Um, you change the, the narrative somehow to fit it, so that you fit in. So you're not bringing the traumatic news. Although this, mm. is, a new, this is not, you didn't create this. Exactly. He didn't create it, but he felt that he, he couldn't put that on to, to someone else. And it's a shame that even as a child, he's mm -hmm. feeling that sense of, you know, that he has to do that. And we as adults yeah. are feeling it as well. Um, Suzanne, your hand is up. What's up? You and me, Suzanne. There's something that we have to be mindful of. And I think um, one of the other guests spoke to this, which is about the everyday racism, the microaggressions and the plethora of experiences um, that are similar to George Floyd globally means that there is a danger that we can become, adults can be become um, slightly desensitized to it. Yeah. Mm. And we can forget the fact that we are also trying to process process our own trauma. Right. Mm. Now this speaks so there is a discussion that kind of really brings it's come up a, a recurrent theme in this a discussion really, which is about our own self care, yeah. which is about creating the appropriateness of spaces where we mm -hmm. can have these discussions. And for some, while some might be in that moment be able to say I'm ready to have the conversation with my child in my school. Others might need to have the time yeah. or yes. might need someone yes. else to broach that conversation. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. And similarly, thinking about different ways to have the conversation. Sometimes mm. it's not a conversation. Sometimes it's a drawing. Yeah. Mm. Sometimes it's in play. Mm. And these are all about, because of the nature of the experiences and the racism that people can experience, we have to have a level of um, emotional well-being where mm. we teach our children and teach ourselves how to connect in with our thoughts and feelings and the different ways we can express that so that when we have, when a, a current event happens, we can know how to approach that with care. And I think it will be very different for each individual. Yeah. And True. so if for some people, it might not be the parent the mom, that might be in the best place to have that. Who knows? She might be mm -hmm. going through her own hell at work. <laughs> and actually she's thinking, how am I going to have this conversation in addition to losing yeah. my job during the pandemic and being on zero hours? Yeah. I'm struggling here. Do you understand? <laughs> so there's, there's something about um, being measured in our conversations and really focusing on the emotional health of our children because mm. even some of it might be to kind of look at countering the narrative mm. with the positive images until you can find a, a safe place for you and your child to discuss it so um, i i don't think there is a a single answer to all of this i think this mm. is a, a a whole picture of different approaches 
around well-being and emotional intelligence and self-care and all those things about safety psychological safety the identity safety all of these things that are needed in order for us to position ourselves in a position of strength and empowerment for our children regardless of the circumstances so it doesn't feel that we're always reacting Mm. to something and mm. react to someone else's gaze and someone else's narratives mm. by the space through all of that where we can claim back the narrative and have something positive and affirming and even within the George Floyd situation to find something that can be enlightening and affirming within that mm. so that there's a positivity that comes out of a, yeah. a brutality yeah. Yeah. So Susan, you took us into our next two questions. And we're actually, we're running out of time. We've been talking for quite a while, ladies, and we're, we're running out of time. So let, let, let me ask the, the last two questions. And if we can answer in, in a way to wrap it up. So the, the next two questions were, one, how do we prepare ourselves as parents to have that conversation with our children? So what do we do? What work do we do on ourselves? And, I, and Simone, your hand has been up, so I'll take you first. So you answer both questions. What work do we do on ourselves so to, pre to prepare ourselves for that conversation? Because we don't want to go in all guns blazing mm. and we're not okay. And yeah. secondly, there are people in our community, in diaspora, who are unable to have the conversation for whatever reason, transgenerational, transmission of trauma, their own trauma that they faced in, 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 in life and in terms of racism. And they cannot come to, to have that conversation with their children. And they know, they are aware enough to know that they cannot have that conversation with their children. How do we, do we have a responsibility? Because, and these people want to have the conversation. Do we have a responsibility to our community to try to help these parents have the conversation? Do you think that there is, there is room for that? Should we take on a responsibility as in a whole to speak to, to support other parents to have that conversation with their children? Am I making sense? Mm, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Simone. Okay, Lou, I'll take the first question. <laughs> I'll let one of the ladies take the second question. Um, how to prepare. Now, Sudan was very, what she just said was excellent about mental health and mental well-being and everything. And um, I sometimes think that um, a mother and a father um, of, a, of a child um, may experience racism differently and may mm -hmm. speak about it differently. So it may be worthwhile um, you know, the, the talk involving both parties as much as possible. So the child's able to hear the perspective of the mother, you know, and also hear the perspective of, a, of, a, of, of the father, you know, female and male perspective, because they could be different, right? And um, again, you know, I mean, my daughter's nine, and I, I don't think it's one talk. I think it's many talks over time um, for, for her for her and that's what I, I think works well um for her um and then lastly i'd like to say you know we are our children's best teachers right? mm -hmm. i am not the best teacher i put my hand up now <laughs> but i i definitely try so ultimately you know how i react how i respond to things and I will speak to racism here and now, you know, ultimately my child is watching, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I'll, I'll give you a very quick example, a quick example, right? My, um, come from a pretty good family, working class, uh, both parents in the home um, and me and my brother. Now, um, my mum wor worked in corporate banking in the UK. Now, back in the you know, I'll say 60s, 70s, 80s, early 90s, you know, um, very few people in her position, she was head of her department in, in, um, in banking, um, made it to those kind of positions, right? Like being a, a black woman. Um, they were able to buy a BMW. Now back in the, I think it was 80s, that was a big deal, you know? 
but with that come the comments, mm. come the oh what is she what is she doing you know to 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 get that kind of car what, what's this and, and you know she doesn't deserve um, that type of to drive that type of car. Um, but my my mum was able to form really really good relationship and do excellent work right so when it came to you know salary negotiations she was on top of her game etc cetera, etc cetera. now what she was able to share with with us as a family was you know directors are coming in and i'm talking 5 10 15 20 years and she would never be promoted to director level she was never once promoted she was more than capable she trained the directors <laughs> they would come in <laughs> she would train them they would leave she'll train the next one so she's training all of these guys and and they were all male caucasian males every single one of them and she never got the opportunity to be promoted um now taking that experience of my mum yeah. um showed me you know life at that time in corporate now for her what she really wanted for, for me was to you know get myself a great education so that maybe you know that, that wouldn't happen to me in my path as it had happened to her okay so watching how i i looked at her and kind of watched how she addressed what happened or what was going on right and taking that uh, experience and, and learning from it and then deciding to go through the route of, you know, um, going through it, um, university and working at different jobs, etc. helped me to deal with, you know, racism as I, as I think about it and as I see mm -hmm. it. So I'm just saying all of that to say, you know, our children are, are watching us and as we experience racism, as we share, they are listening and ultimately, mm -hmm. you know, however we react is how they will also react so we just have to be very careful with you know how we deal with situations that come mm -hmm. you know, to us and our family because ultimately they will they will likely take similar similar routes yeah i'm out mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah so um in you mentioned two things so how do we help people to understand how to speak to people because it can and also how do we prepare ourselves, right? As parents. Yeah. So I was just gonna share, I don't know if you guys, most of you would have seen this, I don't know, but I'm just gonna share, have you guys seen parents this? A Parent's Life Guide to Black Lives Matter? I haven't actually seen it. Yeah, I have so a copy a, of it. Okay, so it's a resources. Um, it's, a, it's a company called Yield Peace. So they took it upon themselves to actually, you know, put something together for parents, because. Again, for me, I can only go by my act, what I think, and yeah. you know how I, I speak to my child. So I think I found this really useful, either sharing yeah. with parents that I think may not necessarily know how to speak to their children, and also me using it as well to, to educate myself. So it talks from anything from introduction to Blacks Like, Blacks like Matter, mm -hmm. to how you speak to your child about the George Floyd matter. So, but this was after I spoke to my son, so I got it late. <laughs> and again, it's important just using resources available and seeing how I can use that to then empower myself and then make that conversation easier for me and also sharing it with other parents that I think may find it useful as well. And also to my wider community, making sure so everyone we'll, hears about we'll it. add the title of that book to the... Um, so it's like a, a PDF document. It's a PDF. Okay. Um, yeah. it's we, can, we can share it, yeah. So people yeah. know how to get it. I and, it's, and I looked at the company up. The company is a child care company. So, okay. Okay. yeah. It's... That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, Tiffany, your hand is up. Your hand up. So, um, I just want to make uh, be raise consciousness that... Uh, I can say it in a privileged way, but we all in this group uh, have a uh, two-parent home for our children. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I want to recognize all the parents who are single. I want to recognize parents who are raising Black children that are not Black. Yeah. And, and, and recognizing, so I say all that, that to say other many scenarios that are out there, single fathers who are raising, um, you know, their children, that um, the conversation to continue in networks like this mm -hmm. where you're 
share and dialogue and be honest and true about your feelings. So I am mm-hmm. very grateful for this opportunity. Also that um, I feel, to be honest, and I'm going to be very candid in 2020, that we are under attack again. <laughs> and so I, I am of the mindset that uh, I have to take care of my brother's keeper. Yeah. And so that, that, can, that can be opened up for dialogue in a different form. But as a result of that, any opportunity I have whether it's to share information or to bring a child into my home, um, I think we don't have a choice. Because if, if it's not your son, it's mine. Or if it's not your daughter, it's mine. So um, I, 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 I'm very, very conscious of building relationships, uh, strong relationships for our children. I mean, Simone is on the call. My daughter is very close to hers. And um, there's a lot of sharing about you know, books that need to be read. And I would like to create some, you know, uh, um, a book a book group where children can read similar books and have discussions amongst their own because sometimes the conversation is between the adult and the child but sometimes the conversations need to happen between child to child because things that we're going to share are not things that they want to share with us um, and that's where they have opportunity to be candid um, in, and then in this era there is a slew of resources that have come up Absolutely. Made, um, like Shile mentioned and so one thing that I, I found helpful is um, it's called the parent And repeat that to me. It's called parent toolkit.com. Okay. And actually uh, I'll put the link in um, the chat, but it's how to talk to uh, kids about race and racism. Mm-hmm. And I found it was very concise and it broke it down. And I think mm-hmm. the other thing is that like let's not be heroes. There are just some conversations that I am not equipped to have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you need to therapy, if you need to reach out to a sister, a brother, someone mm-hmm. in your local congregation, whatever it may be, we have to team up and help each other. Mm-hmm. The other um, resource that I noticed for those who are not in um, are, are in different types of relationships, um, it's called the BIPOC Project Project dot org, um, and there's two women who are um, of of. Uh, um, uh, they, they discuss like what it is to raise children in same-sex home. And so, you know, while I have my own views on things, I recognize that this is a case of we are just raising black children. Yeah. We may not be in position yeah. and we may promote our own views, but the fact is, is that we are under attack. And so I believe that, there, you know, so much stuff is on the internet um, and I am volunteer to like, reach out to me reach out to these ladies in the group. We don't have all the answers either. I'm not professing to say I have it all sorted out either. So, yeah. And I think, I, I asked this question because I think that, that there should be an ownership of the community. Like Tiffany said, it's not just your child, it's, it's my child too, because what affects your child affects my child. Yes. It's kind of a domino effect. And we need to recognize that if somebody's struggling to have this conversation, a necessary conversation, because we know what mm. the research says about children who haven't had that conversation. We have to help that parent some way. Mm. We have, a, I think, we have a responsibility to the community to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the just quickly, yes, yeah, we, just just quickly, Lou. I just, just to add to Tiffany's point, I didn't want that to be missed at all. When yeah. you say community, we're looking at all races within the community, and there's an onus on parents from all races yeah. to actually start to have those conversations oh, yeah. on race and racism and normalize that conversation in their households. So mm-hmm. it's not taboo. It's something we live in a multi um in a diverse community. We have multi, a multicultural um community. So all all families need to start having those conversations as early as possible to say that they are children in your class, they are children in the community of different races, different ethnicities, and normalize that conversation to the tabooness around it mm-hmm. will start to be eradicated. So along um, along with racism. Yes. So I think yes. when people see races as normal, different people of different races as normal in society, I think mm-hmm. that's when people will start to say, well, you know, everyone, well, that this person is equal, this person is equal to me. But the mm-hmm. inf- impurity, I think, will start to be eroded from the community when every household 
white, black, yellow have those conversations from the inception of their children. Yeah. Yes. Ladies, we need to wrap up. So I'd must just like last words from each of you. Sorry. Um, if everybody can give their last word on the, on the matter. There's so much more to discuss around this topic. And I wish we had the time to discuss it, but we can't stay on forever. And this is why we have this panel. So we have this space to discuss topics like this that are pertinent to us as parents and our children. Um, and, and hopefully we can reconvene soon enough to continue conversations along those lines. And thank you so much, ladies, for being here. But can we have last words from you guys? Anybody? Tiffany, I'm sure so I can quickly say mine. So my pledge as a parent is to make sure to keep educating everyone around me, the wider committee and myself, saying that there's a, another resources that, you know, I think all parents should know about. Yeah. And um, there's an organization or a company called Imagine Me Stories. So mm. essentially it's a book company where you subscribe to it and every month your child gets a series of books okay. by black authors, majority. Yeah. So I think for anyone or for parents that are looking for where to start, that would be a good resources to tap onto. Register or subscribe to the book club and then you get, on a monthly basis, you get books by black authors. That's one thing. Okay. And yeah, I think it's important for everyone to keep educating people within a space and also outside of that. Yeah. Uh, Tiffany, I'm going from top to top. <laughs> Uh, for me, when I, I, I say network, and I don't mean in the traditional work network, I mean connection, community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, socially, I'm, I'm totally on board with you. Uh, but more than ever, just show love. Like, yeah. show love to your child. Because as Simone said, that's where it starts at home. And so if you love your child, as we all do, mm -hmm. but we have to go an extra mile, yeah. then the intention is, is bringing people around who also love them unconditionally and I feel like that empowerment will definitely you know make them feel like they can conquer anything and accept their emotions yeah. because even if you're angry that is okay so high come low you are okay in the space that you're in recognizing that you're in a system that is fabric mm -hmm. but you are okay and you're beautiful and you're amazing so that's my last thank thing. you Tiffany Nita I think I'll say something um, that Simone mentioned, which is, is just so pertinent. Create a safe space in your home where your children can come and openly share their experiences. Yeah. Just yeah. make sure you're available for your child as a, as a father, as a mother. Make sure you're available so your child can come and speak about you know, what's, what uh, indifference that they've experienced so that you can help them to manage their emotions around it. Because as they grow, it's not going to stop, it will continue. So yeah. being a shoulder for them, being that, you know, being that strength for them is really, really important as a parent. Yeah. Simone? So Lou, you know, I think this conversation that we've had today is just excellent. I love the fact that there is, you know, it's an international, type panel we've got various different perspectives um and i but all to do with the same issue which is race and racism i was saying to i think was it you colin i said to you the other day um we're all cousins we just all got just dropped off at different ports right so <laughs> we have we have this this monster i think that you know has just affected us all in, in and our families in different ways but I think let's continue conversing let's not stop that you know um George what happened to George Floyd was just terrible and you know it, it has it has just broken many things uh perspectives that I've had and um Will he be the last? I, you know, we have to just continue talking and just developing our children so that they can have, you know, successful lives. Let's mm -hmm. keep talking. Yes. Thank you, Simone. Colleen? Um, I think one of the things that comes to mind for me is be honest with yes. yourself 
-hmm. and with your children. Mm -hmm. um, try not to process your trauma yeah. or how you feel towards all that's transpiring in front of your kids. Mm -hmm. um, removing yourself and being honest enough with yourself, you know, to say, I'm not ready for this conversation yet. Mm -hmm. um, and when you are ready, be honest with them, be open, do not create these um, words <laughs> that don't necessarily match specifically what is happening. Um, I think it's also important as a, as a parent um, to know that when I speak to my child about race, I'm not harming them, I'm actually empowering them. Um, as we spoke about here, there is a system that is set up that that is set up that that is set up with we weren't um, we weren't a part of the discussion. We weren't at the table, and so it's very important for us to teach our children and affirm them of their uniqueness, of the, how amazing they can be, in spite of this system that says you can only grow but this high or, or jump this high or go this grow this high i just think it's so important for us to as parents to just continue to try our best to wrap our minds around what's happening and as simone said this is not the last time this is going to happen this is something that's been happening since 1619 um these these deaths public deaths killings and so mm -hmm. i think it's just important as for parents for us to Find the resources, find the buddies, find the, 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 the connections to know that we're not in it on our own. Like we have a community of people that will help support us. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all I have to share. But this was amazing. Yes, it amazing. was. <laughs> <laughs> Suzanne, last words? How can, I, how can I follow up on the strength of the words so far? Um, I would just say, um, in summary and building on what's been said be kind to yourself yeah. and tell your story amongst all the other stories that are being told tell your own and be open and vulnerable and honest about your uh, triumphs about some of the things that we might get lo lost along the way um, and continue to do that and that's what i want to continue to have with my children so that as the women on this panel have said we can have those safe spaces where the diversity of our stories can be told. I think that's essential right now. Um, yeah. yeah. And I want to reiterate that we need to be honest. We need to be open with our children. Mm. We need to set the groundwork. The groundwork is so important and that's outside of the race issue. You're setting the groundwork by building relationship with your children and then the conversation and then everything else will flow. Yes. Um, be kind to yourself. I want to reiterate as well. Um, and find community and teach your community what you know and support your community. Um, I can't express how grateful I am that you spent all this time with us. We've been talking for so long. We did not intend to stay so long and we've gone far over the time. <laughs> and I'm sure um, there might be hungry bellies waiting for us. So <laughs> let's, um, we're going to call it tonight, wrap tonight with this one. Um, thank you to you and thank you to those of you who joined us on Facebook Live. We will have this recorded and I will put it up again. Um, so people who didn't get to see it from the start and who would like to see it from the start can get to see it. We had a bit of technical issues where we thought we were live on Facebook and we were not. So sorry about that as well. Um, thank you again, Lisa. And thank you everybody on Facebook Live and see you soon.